Good morning. It's great to be together. I want us to turn over to First Thessalonians 2. Hopefully we can finish the all the five, hopefully we can finish the all the five chapters. <laughs> anyway, um, I've been fellowshipping with a lot of us here. I just want to say how Bonnie and I are so grateful. Uh, we have learned so much just in the fellowship, just listening to all the the things that God has done in your life through you guys. And I just, I'm just so excited about it. Last night before I sleep, I prayed to God. I said, God, this is just amazing. And this, this will be the time that I personally will remember for the rest of my life. Yeah. I've never seen a group like this. I told, I don't know how many people I, 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 I told right here. I've never seen a group like this. As a staff or interns or young people, they gather together and just uh, the desire, the passion, just want to advance the kingdom. I've never been in a group like this before. Wow. You know, so I just feel like, wow, I'm very blessed. We are very blessed. And thank you so much Amen. for allowing us to be able to come here. Amen. I don't want us to go back and feel disoriented. <laughs> <laughs> that is not my purpose. Okay. I don't want to come here to create great confusion. Okay. And I don't want at all us to feel guilty. Not at all. Because according to 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 1, you know brothers, that our visit to you was not a failure. <laughs> I just want to make sure that our visit here is actually for us to be able to grow together. Okay? Now, when Paul talked about this, I believe somehow he has been hearing from people. Let me tell you, your visit in Thessalonica, what you did over there was a flop. <laughs> Sometimes we hear voices. I don't know where that voice comes from. Maybe it's our own background, our own dysfunctionality, yeah. and then you feel, oh, I'm just so bad. <laughs> or maybe some other people, you know what? They tell you that you are a flop. The ministry is just bad. But you know what? One thing about Paul, I see he's confident. He said, let me just tell you. I'm not perfect. But I can tell you the difference between failure and success. Amen. According to the world, according to you guys, it's a failure. But let me tell you. What is in the eyes of God? What is success in the eyes of God? Amen? Amen? Amen. So in verse 2, he said, We have previously suffered and been insulted in Philippi. As you know, but with the help of our God, we dare to tell you his gospel in spite of strong opposition. So it doesn't mean that when you really face problems, opposition, you know what, a lot of difficult times, that means it's a failure. Many people, when we look at all this, they're like, oh, we're having a hard time. You know, I come to many fellowships around the world. Yeah. When I see people face difficulty, oppositions, or the church is really going through hurricane, people <laughs> tend to be like. <laughs> but when the church have a lot of baptism, they come to a conference with confidence. Wow. Yeah. I can't wait to share good news. <laughs> Even though I can't do a spell B, spell B. <laughs> I love all the good news, all right? <laughs> but <laughs> I don't want us to define failure because of the current situation that we face. Yeah. We're facing. Yeah. But instead, Paul said in verse 3, For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives. Nor are we trying to trick you. 
On the contrary, we speak as man approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please man, but God who tests our heart. You know we never use flattery, nor do we put on masks to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from men, not from you or anyone else. So according to Paul, the success is not about what, what, what you're facing, the difficulty you're facing, but the success is if you know that you but have only one motive, which is to please God. In any situation, I don't want you to be influenced by whatever problem you're facing. You have to still deal with the problems, but don't let that define you. If you know that what you're doing is to please God and not to please man, if you know it and you know your motive, that is a success. Amen? Amen. You know, Paul didn't flatter people. You know, you know how do you know what was flattery? Flattery is a, you, if you say something to someone that you don't say behind his back, that's flattery. Bro, you're awesome, but when you're behind his back, I don't like that man. That, that's flattery. <laughs> if you please God, you'll be saying the same thing. Yeah. No, how you say it, you got to be wise. <laughs> but it's basically the same thing. And, and this is the proof that Paul is not, to, not trying to please man. He is someone that is actually no God. He got his conviction from God. And he's willing to just say it, to just do it, because he knows this is what God wants. Right. Let me tell you, it's not easy. Yeah. It's not easy in a crowd like this. Right. But this is the definition of success. Yeah. Amen? Amen. And then he said, as apostles of Christ, we cannot have been a burden to you, but we were gentle among you, like a mother caring for her little children. We love you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Amen. Because you had become so dear to us. Surely you remember, brothers, our toil and hardship. We work night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preach the gospel of God to you. The second thing that made Paul really believe that it's a success is because he is willing to be out of comfort zone. Amen. How many of you could imagine Paul like a mother? <laughs> Caring for little children. But you know what? Paul was willing to do that. Of course, all of us, we have our own strength, we have our own style, we have our own personality. But when it comes to the kingdom of God, want to advance God's kingdom, you got to throw away all that and be willing to learn, be willing to grow, become a person. Even to the point, becoming someone that is actually not you. <laughs> really. I've, I've heard many people say, you know what, bro, it's just the way I am. <laughs> I understand that. But how long? <laughs> because your church can suffer. Because you have not grown. I gotta literally learn how to grow. I was, I was someone that's with deep conviction, have a lot of opinion. Vanya and I, both of us like that. Yeah. No, it's just hello. Oh, just me. It's just me. Yeah. Amen. She's my helper. Right. So, so, I remember one day, some of my staff sit me down and said, Bro, you're man, and you're, you're man, you're strong leaders, you do this. But, bro, Sometimes when we come to a meeting, you are too tense, bro. Uh, I said, what do you mean? <laughs> he said, bro, we look up at you, what you say, carry weight. And sometimes uh, we know we shouldn't be just focusing on you, but sometimes I see some of the stuff they consume with you. They see whether you smile or not. And that 
that is not good. Well, let me tell you, I was about to go and, and disciple them on that, you know? <laughs> but this is the verse that helped me. Come on. Good point. Come on. If Paul can become like a mother, Harlem, you can become one like that. Let me tell you, it's not my nature. But I learned to listen, to care for people, ask people, how are you, to laugh. I start watch. I mean, literally, few times before the start meeting, I gotta go and see my own face in the mirror. <laughs> literally. <laughs> I gotta watch my own <laughs> And you know, a few months later, one by one, we stop said, bro, you really changed. I said, in what way? I said, bro, you're more relaxed now. We feel like you're approachable. Wow. We feel we can come to you. We feel safe to come to you. Yeah. Let me tell you, that was not me. But I gotta be able to get out of my comfort zone. Yeah. Amen? Amen. So in verse 10, you are my witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believe. Wow. Can I call myself holy, righteous, and blameless wow. among the people that I'm, in, I'm with? For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging comforting and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. I used to just read verse 11 without reading verse 10. Yeah, good point. The definition of a Paul of a success is he himself is Christ-like. Yeah. So people, whenever people see him, people see him as a holy, blameless, righteous man. And because of that, that carries of that gives him authority to go and be able to deal with the children. Encouraging them, absolutely. You know, comforting them, but and urging them. You see, like, I don't know how many times, five, four times, five times in this book alone, talking about the urgency. Yeah. Yeah. Use the word urging, urging, urging. Of course, we have problems. What I share to you, I mean, don't, don't think that, oh, our churches don't have problems. Uh -huh. We have a lot of problems. Yes. Let me say that again. We have a lot of problems. <laughs> That's good because that really makes us rely on God. Yeah. That's what convinces us that we know this is kingdom of God. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so what I'm saying, we have to be able to be Christ-like ourselves. So that it gives us confidence to help people to be Christ-like. Yeah. It is, God is urging us to call everyone in the church to be Christ-like. One of the ways to do that is we got to deal with people. We got to disciple people. Yeah. But make sure you just don't go and disciple people without you also. Right. Please God. Right. Without you. Yourself, get out of the comfort zone. Be someone that people can feel safe. People can feel like, wow, you really can love them. Yeah. You gotta have that. You gotta just deal with things, but people don't feel safe with you. Yeah. Does it make sense? Yeah. So, let's continue reading. Verse 13. And we also thank God continually. Because when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of man but as it actually is, the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. For you brothers became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are the Christ Jesus. You suffered from, our, from your own countrymen, the same things those churches suffered from the Jews, who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets, and all drove us up. They displeased God and are hostile to all men. Amen? Amen. So, these are the definition of a success. Don't just go into stats and say, well, I'm a, he's a really big failure here. No, no, I don't want you to, to go there. I want you to just focus on this, learn from Paul. He doesn't allow anyone to define the failure, the success. Amen. Amen? Yeah. Now, of course he's facing problem. And uh, we already know the church 
or really under a difficult situation. So it's basically under a lot of pressure, under a lot of persecution, a lot of opposition. So you can see how can you build a church that you were just built three weeks for three weeks and you left them. How can you make sure a church like that, that is under trials and you turn that around and make the church to stand firm in their faith? All right. Amen? Amen. So, we'll be reading from 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 18. Even though Paul was away, look at his attitude here. How he, how he helped the disciples over there to face all the fire, okay. the opposition. How can he help them so that they can have the faith that stand firm? Yeah. Even though he was not there. In 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 18, For we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, did again and again, but Satan stopped us. First Thessalonians 3 verse 1. So when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. We sent Timothy, who is our brother and God's fellow worker in spreading the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you in your faith. There's one thing that Paul always has in his heart. He always wants to be present with the disciples even though he cannot be there because when Paul said Satan really stopped us you really know that he didn't try to make excuse but instead he knows you know what even though Satan stopped me I will not allow Satan to stop me I sent Timothy to go even though my presence cannot be there but I have someone and you have to know that when Timothy is there it's like my presence is there how many of us good point can really encourage the faith of our the people that God entrusted in our ministry or our church and really be there for them. I really make a big change many years ago that no matter how busy, no matter how big our responsibility or the churches, within two weeks, and I, I say that to the church, within two weeks, whoever in the church can spend time with me. And when I say within two weeks, because someone, people say, broken, we spend time, I can do that that day. I already said it. But within two weeks, I'll be spending time with that person. It doesn't matter where they come from. And to this day, I still hold to that promise. Because I don't want the church to think I'm busy. I never, I, I never thought that Jesus made people think that he's busy. He's always with people. So if my church think I'm busy, something is wrong with me. First of all, I'm not like Jesus. I try to portray to people that I'm so busy. Of course you're busy. But don't make people think that you're busy, that you're so you're beyond approach. Any disciple. I already have a few people already text me, bro, when you come back, can we spend time with you? This is a Joe Christian. This is in other sectors. I'm my own sector. We have no other stuff. We have other sectors. Wow. And they come. And when I spend time with them, I hear them out. I, you first question I ask, okay, thank you for that. You want to spend time with me. Is there anything else? Is there anything that you want me to help out? Maybe you want me to get to know you better. I ask them. If there's some problem or some issue that they're facing, I said, is it okay for your staff to come and join? Some of them said, no, can I talk to you personally first? I said, okay. So is it okay for us to spend time the first 30 minutes or 40 minutes, then after that, whoever disciple you or the staff to come and join in? They're okay with that. Okay, so, so that way, because the only thing I cannot do is the follow up. But to be with them, I have no excuse. I have disciples that come from one church, small city we just started, just come over to Jakarta. Bro, can I spend time with you? I said, absolutely. Why? Because that's the only way. That, that's one of the ways for us to go and encourage and strengthen people's faith. Yeah. That's for us. Let me tell you, when I spend time with these people, I got so much insight and understanding about yeah. what yeah. he or she is, fine, he is, is facing, but also about what's really happening in the church. Yes. You know, some, some of the church leaders that we have, yeah. when, they, when they come to you, when we meet together, they're like so humble. But you know, when they go back to their, their own place, they're like little king. That's what I found out. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about us, okay? 
oh man, when they got a bro, can I sit down? I would never imagine that this guy, when he goes back to his own place, he's like little king. I would never. And I thank God for sending these people. Wow. And I take time to be with them. Wow. Never allow anyone to say you're busy. They know you're busy. But Jesus, imitate Jesus. Amen? Amen. I, I mean, I've been to uh, many churches that struggle in their faith. I always share this verse. I said, the first thing you got to do, don't just try to preach. I said, when I come, I will spend one or two days fellowship with them, getting to know them. Be there with them. Listen. Don't even try to even preach to them. Listen, listen, listen. Then you know exactly what they, they are going through. What kind of fire they are going through. That's the best way to turn around into crisis. The church in crisis. Be the young presence is very, very, very important. Amen? Amen. And then you find out about their faith. In verse 5, for this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent Timothy to find out about your faith. Amen? I talked about it already. And then night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. You pray with them. I love to spend time with people, but it's good for people to know that we pray for them. Right. I have people that we go visit, we just probably just met him like once a year. But you know what? One thing that I always love to do is after that, after we meeting them, I said, bro, we text. Oh, now with technology, so, so, so simple. It becomes, it's so helpful. I text them, I said, bro, I just want to know, after we meet, I pray for you. Mm -hmm. That one text will keep them alive another one year. Yeah. They feel like you're thinking yeah. of them. They feel yeah. special. Yeah. And I ask them, is there, is there anything else that you want me to pray for you? That's what makes your prayer become very, very rich. Yes. Because you know what's going on around. Amen? Amen. Good boy. And, and when you've done all that, this is what God will do to you. In verse 6 to 9, but Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love. He has told us that you always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us, just as we also long to see you. Therefore, brothers, in all our distress and persecution, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. Amen. For now we really live, since you are standing firm Amen. in the Lord. Yes, your faith was under trial. But you know what? Yes, you know what? I want to make sure that you know that I love you. I want to be there for you. I pray for you. <coughs> I want to find out about your faith. But it's one thing. This is, this is the reward from God. God will encourage you. When you hear that their faith is standing firm. When yeah. this brother turning around. Yeah. That is God's word. And for now, we really, and then he said, how can we thank God enough for you in return? For all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you. Sometimes it just, it just takes us one extra hour to be with these people, troubled people. But let me tell you, the joy that comes, the reward from God is amazing. And, and, and many times when I face difficult situations, sometimes I, I, I am discouraged. God just somehow sent this good news. Yeah. Joy. Yeah. I don't know the spending time that I had with one brother six months ago. And it's just, bro, I just... And you know God is there to encourage you. Right. And you just feel like, God, thank you that I did take the time to spend time with that brother only for one hour mm -hmm. in the midst of all the busy schedule. Yeah. Does it make sense? Yeah. That's, that's the reward that comes from God. Another thing that I want to say is this is God's factor. You can do our, our, our own things and we need to be there for people, but this is another thing that we have to be praying. Paul says in verse 10, I, we already read that, night and day we pray for you uh, most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. Let me ask you, because Paul knows he's not perfect, but he's confident enough to say, you know what, I know your, your faith is firm right now, right now, but we want to continue supplying what is lacking in your faith. And all of a sudden, he's, take, he, he's taking a big turn there. He said, now, may our God and Father himself. All of a sudden, he start talking about, may God himself. 
It's not him. Because he knows that he will not be able to make the person complete. But that doesn't lower his expectation to keep supplying what is lacking in the faith. Sometimes we also don't know exactly what does it takes to supply what is lacking in someone's faith. But this is when we got to really rely on God and not stop praying for them and not expecting from them. Because he said, now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other. I can teach people to love one another. I can try to make them really loving each other in a small group. But let me tell you, God will take it higher. Yeah. God is the one who that will supply what is lacking. Yeah. Yeah. To have overflowing kind of love. Yeah. Let me tell you, sometimes I, do, I, I can't even imagine. But I'm looking forward. And I know God is the one doing that. Yeah. It takes God. So God loves to be partnering with us. God loves to work together with us. So we do our part. But let God do. That's his yeah. part. Just as ours as well. May he strengthen your heart so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father. I can make people holy, blameless. But that doesn't make me stop from discipling them and helping them out. That doesn't mean that I gotta stop from allowing other people to also disciple me. But by the end of the day, it is God that will be doing that. And we shouldn't lower our expectation. When you see disciples, you look into their eyes. You're like, God, I know you want that. And I will be praying that you will supply what is like. Yeah. Yeah. Does it make sense? Yeah. Amen. Come on, Harlan. First Thessalonians chapter 5. All right. Verse 12. Now we ask you, brothers, to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in the love, in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. Okay? You gotta hold them in the highest regard in love, not because they are perfect, not because, wow, you, you, they, 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 they have so many great qualities. No, but because of their work. But he said, you got to allow yourself to have people over you and admonish you. You know, when you look into the word admonish, admonish is not just teach. Yeah. Admonish is like teach to the point that you will obey. Come on. Yeah. That is some, some, sometimes I feel like that's the art that has been missing in the church lately. I'll be introducing a discipling model that we adopt in C region. Uh, that we have been using for years and very helpful. And of course, I said again, that's just a model. No, I think it's perfect. But get the conviction out of this verse. Because sometimes we feel like, no, 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 Paul commanded people. You know what? Respect them. Hold them in highest regard. Because you know what? Of their word. And they will admonish you. Of course, they will encourage you, but they will admonish you. And, and, and when, 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 if you look at the, 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 the greatest commission, go and make disciples. He said, you go make them disciples and teach them to obey. Yeah. We all have children. I mean, not all of us. Okay? <laughs> Sorry. Most of us, we have children. So, I know when I teach my children, and when I teach my children to obey, these are two different things. Oh, yeah. oh. Because if I teach my children to obey, I'll be falling up again. And I expect them to go. And I, there's a certain expectation. Does it mean? Does it make sense? And I will put it forward very clearly what is the expectation. You don't just go and teach people or mentor people, whatever you call it, or disciple people without expectation. Because it is a good word. It is not a dirty and bad word. And money is, is in the Bible. Amen? Amen. And we, I mean, when the crisis happened, we brought that culture back to the church, even in the midst of sensitivity at that time, because we believe the Bible is always right. Yes. You don't want people to swing to the other pendulum because of their experience, because Satan can work. But you gotta allow God's word. Amen? Amen? So, 
And then this is, this is what happened. Hold them in highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. Look at the expectation of what is, what is the discipling relationship that happened. It's a live in peace with each other. And we urge you brothers, warn those who are idle. Encourage the team. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Wow. When I read this, be patient with everyone. I don't think I can, I can do that. Because when you read the Bible, you're like, I got to see that happening in my life, man. In the life of the church. I don't want to just to take the, the word of God lightly. I want to see that happening in my life. But to be patient with everyone, when am I going to be at that point? Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always try to be kind to each other and to everyone else. Try to be kind with everyone. Of course, I can be kind to people that, you know, it's nice to me, but be kind to people that is really biting me. Hello, bro. <laughs> and you purposely come to that person and just, hey bro, even though you know yesterday he was like really biting you. They're bad. So how to do that? But this is what the Bible told us. This is the expectation of the Bible. You remember the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5? Yeah. Verse 22? But the fruit of the Spirit, look at this. Love. He mentioned about love before. Alright. Joy, peace. He mentioned about peace. He mentioned about patience. About kindness. Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control against such things, there is no law. Basically, what Paul is referring in 1 Thessalonians 5, of course, sometimes it's not in the exact order. But basically, it's about the same thing. Yeah, he talks about fine. the fruit of the Spirit. That's why he said in verse 16, this is also a famous verse, be joyful always. That is in the context. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. You know, put out the Spirit's fire. I cannot, if you just leave it to me, I cannot be patient with everyone. But you know what? That will not lower my standard because this is what God's command. How to do that? It is God's promise. Look at that. This, this, this verse of all the, the verses I just read you, this is what encouraged me the most. He said, for this is God's will for you, Harlem. If this is God's will for me, he will do it for me. This is the fruit of the Spirit. Amen. Peace, patience, kind, joy. And if I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, and if I say I really believe that, you know what? God will enable me to do that. That is the fruit. It's not because I try to work it out. It is the fruit. So when I disciple someone, then of course there's a part that I got to do, but I got to also believe there's a fruit of the Spirit. That God will be working. Does that doesn't make sense? Yes. Okay. I want to talk about our discipling model now. Teacher. So as a young Christian, they will have a teacher. So it's very directive still. And we see that usually happening within a year or two in any new disciple's life. And we told them that. Whether they're businessmen, whether they're older, whatever, we said in a respectful way, we will have teacher-student kind of relationship. So it's more like a lot of instruction, high directive. And then after that, along the way, we shift. We become a consultant to them. It's less directive, it's more like, it's more like, okay, what, what consultant the client, just imagine that way. Of course, this is not your client, this is your brother, okay? <laughs> but it's more like, bro, I need advice, I don't, then, Based on that, you come in. So it's less directive. All right. So it's most of the time as a consultant as the relationship progress, progressing. And then this is like sometimes you're a counselor. Counselors means we really get deep into their life, really get into, you know, many people come from dysfunctional family and all that. You, you, you have to make them feel safe to the point that they feel like they can really allow you to go even into their past. And you can really get to the deepest part of them. Amen? Amen. But it's always friend. Yeah. So just like me, like, like Vani and I with our daughters, when you're little, it's very high directive. But then you cannot be high directive until like they're 17, 20 years old. You got to change. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes we want our children to grow, but we don't grow ourselves. <laughs> so you know, that was our mistake in the past. Yeah. Right. But after the crisis, somehow we stopped being a parent. 
You can do that. You abandon your children. And they will create more problems. That's a very irresponsible parent. And it's like because of a crisis. Eve, how many of us, when your kids, maybe you have a tough time, one day your kids are, I don't want you to be my parent. Probably they will say things. But does that mean that you stop being their parent? No, you love them. You still love their parents. You will never abandon them, right? Same thing. The crisis could happen. Amen. God really purify us. But you cannot stop being a parent. But you just have to grow in your discipling relationship. But we're always friends. Amen? Amen? So, let me just... Now, this doesn't mean that this is just a young Christian. How about someone that has been a Christian for 15 years? Yeah. When they face crisis or certain situation that they've never really been able to get out of, I, without hesitant, tell them, bro, in the next three months, six months, we will, I know we are friends, but this is what we're going to do. I'm going to give a lot of instruction and our relationship that time become teacher student same thing I, I mean when uh, we, we were leaving a church but then when our, our daughters going through a teenagers I come to people and said please disciple me give me specific instruction because I've never passed through that stage it doesn't matter how long you're a Christian you can be a Christian for 20 years 30 years but there's certain areas in your life that you are not being able to pass, to overcome. You can be leading a church for 20 years. There's certain situations you have not been able to overcome. Allow people to come and say, and take initiative and say, bro, I just want to be a student really learning from you. Amen. This is the model that we have been applying in our region. And I, I, have a, you know, I, I mentioned a lot yesterday about the, 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 the ladies that we have. A lot of them actually, I'm no more having this teacher-student relationship. A lot of them is basically in this relationship. Mostly it's consultant. So they call me up. But we, we create a habit of getting advice. Yes. So I always constantly have a bro, can I spend time? Even for them to just do that. They will say, bro, can I get advice from you? It's really good. It's a good culture to build. But the culture will never happen if you do not teach and expect that. Yes. Yeah. And make it clear to people. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. So, but we always frame. Yeah. Okay? So, is it, is it clear? Yeah. Okay. So, whatever model you want to adapt, it's up to you. But the expectation from God's word, I think it has to be very clear. Amen. Okay, look at this. This is just an example of consultant, you know, Philemon. Therefore, I, although in Christ I could be bold and order you, to do what you ought to do. I can be very directive. Yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. Look at the language. Yeah. This is definitely not like teachers, students, I'm, even though I could do that. But I choose to be in other different kind of relationship with you. Amen. I'm appealing to you. He used the word, I appeal to you for my son on SMS. It's not for my own sake. Yeah. It's not for self-interest. He said, but I did not want you to do anything without your consent. What a respectful way to do that. There's a certain time when why my guys ask me advice, I, said, I have strong opinion. I said, this is what it is. Since you ask my advice, this is my, my, I just want you to consider it. I just want to appeal to you. But I will not be forcing that to you. That's a stage. It's very clear. That's a stage of relationship. Consultant. But when I'm a teacher, student relationship, when I tell them, I said, you got to go. I want you to go back. Look into the Bible again. Pray about it. But I'm not just want you to consider this. I want you to take it seriously. You know what? I said, I'm human. I can make mistakes. But let me ask you this question. Do you think I love you? Do you think I care for you? Do you think I want the best for you? He said, yes. Let me tell you, even though my advice is wrong, God will bless it. That's right. yeah. true. Because you submit to authority of God. I tell them, without hesitation. I believe when the Bible says, children honor your parents, I really believe that verse. Because I've seen many children that don't honor their parents. Man, they face big trouble in their lives. I mean, a lot of mistakes as a, as a, as a leader in the family. 
At times, I make a call, I make a decision. Bonnie is like, amen. I submit. Let me tell you. A year later, I look at my decision. I said, that's a wrong decision. <laughs> but God bless. That's the way God works. God knows we are not perfect. But the, don't just see the other side of us, we are not perfect. And then you don't dare to go and tell people. All right. I don't know how many times I look at a church situation and I look at that brother. He lives God. He messed up. Because his disciples don't act like parents. I look back and I'm like, bro, had you just go and really be confident that time? Yeah. This thing will not happen. Mm. I believe we all make mistakes. Yeah. That's why we all need the grace of God. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that He has chosen you. I want to introduce this model. We call it the five C's. All right. And now I'm going to have Vanya come forward and share. Um, in our discipling, we have our discipling model, but this is basically our goal. What are the things that we disciple them? We focus on these things. We call it five C's. Of course, Christ has to be the center. The first C is calling. We want to make sure when we disciple someone, we want them to know that the center of everything is Christ, absolutely, but they have to know what is God's calling for them. What is the mark? What is the, 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 the race that God marked for them? Everyone has to really be confident about their own calling. Okay? And then another one is character, their character. The third C is connection. We help them to grow in their connection, in caring for people. Another one is the competence. If they know their calling, then they have to also grow in the competence, the skills of how to do that. All right? It's not just about the heart, the character, but also in the competence. Yeah. And you see the circle over there, the circle is the community. And the more we grow people in their character, in the connection, the caring, and also the competence, the bigger the community that they will be able to impact. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so. These are our focus. When we spend time in our D time, these are the things that we are basically talking about. We talk about their character. And we show them about Christ's character. Which character they want to grow. We talk about their connection. About how, how they love, how they care. I mean, ask people around you. Can they see you as someone that really be able to connect well with people? To make people feel safe. To people feel like, wow. You understand? And then the competence. I think that's pretty self-explanatory there. And then we come up with a scale, and we start working on the scale. So we start looking at this. Some people, they're actually very low in the calling, <laughs> you know, but they, they themselves have a good character in that. So, so we, have, we have a certain measurement for people to know, and they know actually they're growing in that. They know what they need to be focusing on. So we start off by sitting down. Let's say a disciple and disciple, we sit down, okay, bro, this is one, these are the things that we're going to work on. But let's see, there are five areas. Just tell us where are you at right now in each of these skills. And then we're going to work towards growing on the scale. Does it make sense? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to have Vanya come forward and All share. Right. I submit. No. <laughs> Um, you know, I think sisters, it's, it's, uh, I mean, learning all this, you need to know your role because sometimes as sisters, when the brothers are involved in like a lot of situation in the church, the biggest temptation for the sisters is actually to like, Ooh, you know, that's, that's the brothers. And I, I, I feel like as sisters, we need to be role model for all the women around us. We don't have to be perfect, but how do we role model being Christ-like? You know, Hallam and I, we, you know, we've been married for almost 25 years. Most of our years are spent in the ministry. And we dated and we both have very strong opinion. But I think the church understand that, you know, when, when Hallam decides for something, I support. When he decides that we'll be traveling around Indonesia, I was like, okay, you know, 
How do I do that? I need to detach from all the things at home. I think the hardest part for me is actually the attachment, you know, with what's comfortable. But when, you know, as, as women in the ministry, it's very easy for us to be tempted to like, you know, oh, this is a sacrifice. Oh, you know, I can't do that. I mean, it, it's not easy, but are we getting help? Are we getting advice? I think for us to be able to teach how to be a good disciple, we need to first be one. You know, it is very important for us to show um, our children, physically, spiritually, that we are constantly getting advice. Not because we are not thinking. You know, the Bible says that the advice of many will actually save us from a lot of things. And that is something that I'm so grateful for being in the kingdom because we have so many amazing wisdom. And had only we opened our mouth, we can avoid a lot of things. Yeah. You know, in, in practicing all this uh, discipling model, I think we both had to learn that when we care enough for someone, we will actually speak the truth in love. Yeah. Right. We will actually address it. You know, we have a lot of situations, even before we left for this trip, oh my goodness, we have so many situations that we have never, like, Ooh, this is new. <laughs> and we have to discuss, like, you know, there are some situations it's beyond us. We just have to trust God. But we actually need to get advice and talk about it. And we are grateful because in the region, we have a group of people that we can bounce ideas with, we could get advice. But occasionally, we'll, you know, we'll make some phone calls. And it's always good to, to build Friendship, you know, this this is something I would like to advise all the young intern that this is the time for you to build friendship with so many people in this room so that you always have a resource to run to. You know, we don't need to know everything. Sometimes I told my sisters, like, I don't know. Let me let me make some phone calls, I'll get back to you. <laughs> because I don't know. I've never been in that situation. You know, we have a couple situations where family members, their, their children are facing mental illness. I've never handled that. So we made so many phone calls, and then we got advice. And now, you know, they, they overcame the situation. Now they are the resource. You know, it's, it's really cool to see how God allowed things to happen. And we always bring this perspective to people who are facing a lot of trials. Look, you're facing this because God knows you can handle it. But when you face this, do we do it our way or do we do it God's way? Do we do it our way or do we get godly advice? And I think this is a process that all of us have to go through. But when, after we overcome it, are we allowing people to use our experience, pain, and suffering to be a resource for another person. And it is so awesome to see that, you know, we have a couple situations in our ministry where it was so hard watching them because we are their best friends. When we watch them go through the trials, I cried with them. You know, we had, we, when, when, when the daughter was going through a situation, we had the daughter spend the night with me and we saw how hard it is and then things, one thing at a time, like, things happen within the, the span of three years and keep coming. But now they overcame and they are the resource. And that is something that's the beauty of, you know, how God works. And we just have to be so sensitive that, you know what, God allowed this to happen for his purpose. And I think in discipling, that's the same thing. If we could bring people to have the right perspective, you're in this situation because God allows it. God is not mean, but God knows you can handle it. And God will provide the resources for you, had only you are humble. I think humility is such a, 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 the essence of discipling. 
You know, we, we, we can teach a lot of people on discipleship, but we need to constantly remind them that we are a disciple our whole life. You could be amazing leader. You could be like region leader, whatever you call yourself. But we are disciple at heart until the day we die. And that's the right attitude we need to keep. Amen. When was the last time we come to our brothers or sisters and said, please disciple me? Disciple is not a dirty word. I can see myself make it to happen. If I don't get discipling in my life. Wow. I want to be with Jesus. I want to be holy, blameless, righteous. And I need disciple. Amen? Amen. So whatever model that you guys come up with, my encouragement is this. Keep learning. Keep growing. Keep asking advice. Because the more we grow, the more God can really use us to really impact our community and really advance the kingdom. I mean, I've seen, I look at ACR, you guys are very blessed, you guys have so, I've seen so many resources. But of course, we gotta keep growing together. Okay, I think um, even though, I mean, our church in Indonesia know, I can come up with resources. But they know, and I train my staff to always learn. So, I mean, I don't know how often the staff said, bro, 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 we got these things. What do you think? You sit down and, and it's from other people. It doesn't have to be from me. It has to come from other people. And, I, and right now, we have so many staff right now comes like, bro, I got this idea. But it's not like they want the idea to be listened to, but they're also open to put into practice other people's idea. Does that make sense? When we have that kind of a collaboration, when we have that kind of a spirit, I think God will really bless us. So we love you guys. Thank you so much. Hope this is helpful for all of you. Thank you.